Hello, everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce, or not introduce in this case, because she's been artist in residence for the last, f nearly, f this is the fifth week, uh, Tintin Wulia, who's um, from Indonesia, but living in Australia. And she's part of our series um, that Cassart have kindly backed. Um, I'm um, going to remind you that she's done the, the map installation in Studio 24 upstairs. That's the Peninsula Studio in undergraduate painting. Um, just a little bit about her careers. Um, she's got an ongoing project in the central district of Hong Kong till mid-2016. It's called Trade Trace Transit. It's a series of interventions into a close-knit social economic network of cardboard stakeholders comprising of multinational groups. I think we'll hear more about that in this talk. Um, the last four years, she's been in a number of biennale, biennales, um, the Sharjah Biennale, the Asia Pacific Triennale in Brisbane, the Guangzhou Biennale in Korea, the Moscow Biennale, the Georgia Biennale in Indonesia, um, tremendous amount of different exhibitions and things. And she also before was in the Istanbul Biennale, so look forward to hearing all about it. And it's been wonderful having her as in residence, so thank you very much, Tintin. Okay, thank you. Can, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. And thank you all for coming. I think I'll try to lower the light, if Miles is okay with it. Is that okay? Um, well, before I begin, I'll actually show a small video. And um, this was made in early 2003, um, when 9-11 um, and its impacts were still fresh in everyone's mind. And also, it, it was actually made um, a few months after a suicide bomber, oh well, a suicide bombing in um, my home island in Bali, in Indonesia. Um, the title, is um, where do you originally come from? And um, it's, it's a question that I, I have been asked over and over again since I was a child, basically, like, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Bali. No, 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 but you don't look Balinese. I don't even know that, that there is a, a Balinese look, but basically, where do you originally come from? Well, and I would, well, you know, um, my father loves my mother very much, and so, you know, <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> here you go. I'm, I'm Deepak Kumaran Hi, Menet. I'm Daniel Ang. I, um, I come from Malaysia. I live uh, in Malaysia. Where do you originally come from? Um, oh, uh, Malaysia, originally, but I'm now currently uh, living in India. My grandparents came from Italy. I, I think India. I hope it's India. Uh, <laughs> I, I was born in the I States. I grew up in New York. Why, why do you hope it's in New York? Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I don't want to get an identity crisis now because I'm behaving like an Indian. Monica. What is cultural identity? I think cultural identity is a myth. I mean, this is the You've whole point. You've been a crisis if I'm not an Indian. I feel like I'm being <laughs> blamed for being American even though I haven't lived there in 20 years. Ah, it's terrible. Uh, I used to think I was Canadian until I went to visit Canada. Now I think I'm a Quebec. Wow. <laughs> Quebec. Uh, now become very <laughs> Cultural identity is a fraud. Now we are terrorists, so so we have to get a visa. I would get rid of passports. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I think there should be no more. Unfortunately, we live in the real world. Yeah, but it's the thing is, if you lose it, that's it. You know, it, all your information is on that one card. Your life is on that card. Yeah. And well, this video was made in the UK, actually. Um, I was invited to the Manchester International Short Film Festival in 2000, late 2002, and I was part of the, I was going to be part of the um, Berlin Ale, first ever Berlin Ale Talent Campus in early 2003. So in between, I just stayed here, visited friends in London and family in Germany, and, um, and met all these people in Manchester, basically, um, in, in, the, in that short film and um, great artists and filmmakers. Um, and since then, and I don't, I don't, well, I don't know whether it's related, but since then I've, um, the passports actually appear, reappear um, quite a lot in my work. Um, so tonight I'll talk about a few creatures that keep reappearing in my work. 
Um, and these include the passport, mosquitoes, okay. And I'll also talk about how they led me to my current approach to making, making work, in which people, um, or rather individuals, are really important as the smallest unit of um, uh, social dynamics. Um, obviously, like anything else, well, this is just one of the angles that I can see my work as. And um, so the next 40 minutes, I'll just focus on this angle, and then we'll have about 20 minutes in the end for discussion and um, questions. Um, I need to turn off the... There you go. Okay. <laughs> well, around mid-2000s, I lived in Jakarta, and... I'm um, showing you this short film that's quite conveniently silent so I can talk over it because this was my housemate um, at the time and one of them actually and we'll see other, uh, the others later in the film and he's going out of our house actually to an alley and so this is where we lived um, it's about uh, five kilometers away from the Australian embassy and in fact when the Australian embassy was again it was a suicide bombing in 2004. Uh, 2004. Um, <coughs> our house actually shook with the blast wave. Um, anyway, I, I'm showing the, you this video because of two reasons. Firstly, it's sort of flirting with the idea of determinism and parallel universes, many worlds interpretation. And the question of if one thing changed, would your life be, would, would your life result in the same thing, basically, which I think it's an interesting question, especially um, because of its implication in history and everything, basically, like where you're born, for example, like if I was born uh, in another country, would, would my life be totally different? Um, and also second reason, because in that alley, there were just millions of mosquitoes. And this was filmed with a mobile phone, so you can't really see, you know, it's really low res, and so you can't really see the mosquitoes, but believe me, there are millions, millions of them. In fact, well, every sunset, to give you a, a, a picture, um, every day at sunset, our neighbor, a man in his 60s, would go out of his house, sit in front of his fence, and um, he would be holding a mosquito racket, you know, you know what a mosquito racket is, right? It's, it's basically electrocuting the mosquitoes, and he would go like that, like really slowly, as though he's playing, a ten like he's playing tennis slow motion, and there's of course a soundtrack to this, it's like. <coughs> that's, that's how many mosquitoes there were. It's just amazing, it's just clouds of mosquitoes, and I'm quite glad we're not living there anymore. Well you know, nice memories and everything, but yeah, ex my ex-housemates and I, we all live in different countries now, and that, that brings me back to passports. So, passports have always been interesting to me because they are so contradictory. Um, people often see them as a symbol of freedom to move, but then actually, you know, um, for most people, I think they're a barrier to move. Um, and also, people also feel that it's such a personal item, they hold them dear to their heart, but it's actually not even yours, it belongs to the state. And so, you know, but mostly, of course, I love the passports <laughs> because it's such an effective tool for swatting mosquitoes. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, though, I love mosquitoes. Um, I, I even think that maybe in another world, in another universe and actually I am a mosquito and I really admire them um, after I started working with them I found this really good book by an, a mosquito expert called um, Andrew Spillman he uh, passed away unfortunately already uh, but uh, um, so his book I, I found his book fascinating I'll just read you a passage from there in ancient China <coughs> Men traveling to malarious areas were advised to arrange for their wives' remarriage before departing. Many Egyptian mummies have enlarged spleens, a symptom of the disease. Alexander the Great was likely killed by malaria in 323 BC. Carthage was known to be infected at the time of Christ, 
and malaria probably helped prevent Genghis Khan from invading Western Europe. Until the 1890s, no one would know for certain that the fevers, which probably afflicted Lucy and the very first human beings to evolve in Africa, were carried by mosquitoes. But many observers reached reach conclusions that brought them to the, uh, closer to the truth. Time and again, physicians and chroniclers correctly associate the dirty standing waters with these illnesses. And they also link them to travel, armies on the move, and the clash of cultures. <coughs> That's from the book, uh, Mosquito, the Story of Man's Deadliest Foe. It's really, if you're interested in mosquitoes, that's, that's a book to read. And I'll, I'll read you another passage here. The, am the, the amazing adaptive qualities of mosquitoes and pathogens combined with travel, trade, <coughs> and natural events to present modern society with endless possibilities for diseases and vector mosquitoes to arise in surprising places. In Greater New York in 1999, a rash of human encephalitis cases occurred in the borough of Queens. Thus began an episode that would become the most publicized outbreak of a new mosquito-borne disease in history. In the end, the New York experience would become the perfect illustration of the challenges we face in an area of, in an era of disease without borders. And that brings me back to passport again. Too much mosquitoes already. Too much of anything is never good, especially mosquitoes. So I started making this passport work, the collection of togetherness with only 20 passports. Everyone thought I was crazy because I was um, so determined to make the 20 passports in one week, actually. And I did it. And that was a few years after I started making um, installations. Um, and I started making installations partly because I started to feel uneasy with, the, with film as medium because it felt really one way, basically. And one way for me has this connotation with the dictatorship that I grew up in, in Indonesia. And so um, this is also partly why in 2002, um, with a few friends, I established um, an organization, a short film organization called Minikino. And basically, we focus on screening short films, but various short films programmed in a way that it represents varying uh, viewpoints. And the discussion is actually a major important part of the screening as well. Um, so anyway, this project, Recollection of Togetherness, is an ongoing project shown in stages. I, I do a few ongoing projects like this in different models, basically, which I will also show you in a bit. I call these ongoing projects cycles. So this particular passport cycle, Recollection of Togetherness, is a project where I imitate passports from our countries in the world. And um, it's ongoing. And by imitating, I mean really making each passport from scratch by hand. And the project will be ongoing as long as we allow the border system to rule our world, basically, or, um, or until I die, or maybe until I get too lazy to for it, whichever comes first. <laughs> Why is it ongoing, you ask? Well, now imagine um, when I started, and when I started in 2007, um, there were, I think, 192 countries that are acknowledged by the UN, uh, by the member states of the UN. And then, um, uh, the next year, there was actually a new, Monte uh, a new passport, which was a Montenegro passport. And then in 2010, for example, the old Yugoslav passport became obsolete. And so, you know, the passports keep, keep coming and going. So basically, I'm sort of um, 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 following this you know, geopolitical movement around the earth by making these passports. Um, there's also this new country called Trans Transnistria, for example. It's, ed, uh, it's at the edge of Moldova, and it's acknowledged by Moldova as its own authority, but um, uh, not yet in the UN. But who knows, in 10 years, all the UN member states might acknowledge it, and so it might issue a new passport. So as you've seen in my video earlier, that video is a proof that I did swat mosquitoes with each one of the passports. Of course, when you do that, you'll get blood specks going through the pages, right? And so what I did was I identified each of the blood specks and wrote names on it. But yeah, and well, 
Yeah. <laughs> Each time it was shown in each state, the passports are arranged in gradation of colors and the configuration responds to the gallery space. I started with 20 passports in 2007 and now I have about 150 passports. At one point, I also lost six of them. Um, so if any of you is a border police, please, please keep in mind when you see them around, someone's using it, please resend them to me. <coughs> Um, and as you've seen, sometimes I also them, uh, show them with video. Stage seven and eight, for example, were performances with uh, performance score and um, uh, could be performed by someone else with um, two channel video and unsynchronized. And um, this one is stage six, which was a game performance where people get to write their names into the passport, while some people got the privilege of pushing the pedestals, so it falls like dominoes. And, um, well, I'll get back to talking about game performances in a bit. The latest stage of recollection of togetherness was stage 10, <coughs> shown earlier this year in 2015 in Windsor, a city that's uh, bordering, uh, a city in Canada that's bordering Detroit. Um, and this picture was taken with a mobile phone, so you can't really see it, but, um, it's actually the mosquitoes that are practically making the passports fly. <laughs> Still on passports, in 2009, I made an interactive passport work called Lore. It's basically a trail of passports leading up to that vending machine. And you can play the vending machine, so you can put the coin in, and then you can play, try your luck, and um, you can win a passport. But only, only if you're lucky, or if you're skillful, whichever way you want to believe it. Since this was made in 2009, it's been very popular in many, many shows, attracting as many as 300 players per day in Art Hong Kong 2012. One of the shows was a mall, uh, was in a mall in Jakarta, and so, and I really like the responses there, and so I'm trying to put this in such public places now. In Moscow Biennial, the first weekend, the machine broke down because of overuse. <laughs> and while it was being repaired, the, organizer, the organizers actually told me that someone wanted their ticket money back because they came especially to win a passport, to try winning a passport <coughs> to the machine, and it's broken. Um, here we see people flocking to play in Art Hong Kong 2012, and we got a winner, ladies and gentlemen. So, when, well, even when doing installations, I keep thinking about how much I enjoy the conversations stimulated by the work and how much I've also learned from them, actually. So um, at the same time, because of my interest in borders, I became more and more interested in social dynamics, how you know the, the more saturated um, a, a certain group is with colorful individuals, and especially when you put an element of chance in it, um, the more complex and, un and unexpected the dynamics will be. This is in relation to my view that the border is not a line, it's a space, and it's actually a social space. And that's when I started doing what I call game performances. Ah, by the way, remember the video of me swatting mosquitoes in the beginning? Um, I actually made that to explain how the mosquitoes got in the passports in, um, in my installation recollection of togetherness, basically. But then people started asking even weirder questions when they saw the video. They were like, but you know, how, how did, how, you know, how, how, how did the mosquito get in the passport? How, how can you swat them? And so, so I made this work, which is practically a one-on-one -on -one magic show um, with the passport that I call how I captured those wantons. I used the earlier video, micro study for once, and you see them, um, those two channels there. And then I use uh, my passports from the recollection of togetherness and um, uh, their props in this game performance, basically. A lot of people were mesmerized when they were standing in front of me with the blank page, um, uh, uh, with the open passport on the blank page and re ready to swat the mosquitoes. And so, um, you know, I, I would tell them, okay, look at that video now. Mosquitoes are coming. Mosquitoes are coming to your passport. And
When the mosquitoes land on the page, let's just swap them with these passwords. And so, so we would do that together, and then we would um, stamp on the passport to make sure that no mosquitoes are dead and squashed, squashed basically. And, um, and then when we go flip through the pages of the passports, we found that we've managed to, <coughs> to swap the mosquitoes that were in the videos, in the passports. So it's very good magic, actually. Um, in a lot of this game performance, I interact one on one with people, and my record so far is was in an art fair in Art Stage Singapore in 2012, where I played Para Incognita etc. with 700 people in three days. Some of you might know this game as I've been doing it um, at the Slate. Um, basically, with this one, I started with a blank world map in dimension projection. And the mission each time is to make a new world map, and based on luck and, and certain rules, you would claim an area of the world <coughs> with your last name, somehow collectively painting a new world map. Um, the Terra Incognita, etc., that I'm hosting at the, the Slate is um, the ninth iteration of it. Um, it's still on at the Slate, and we'll be erasing the wall back to white um, after this talk. Uh, and by the way, you might have noticed, um, I've mentioned statistics, like the numbers of people, the numbers of players, as though it's really important. Um, uh, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, the more saturated the social dynamic is, the better for me. And it's also like looking at a um, um, high definition, high resolution image. Um, so if we imagine the people as the pixels, um, the more the pixel within a certain area, the higher the resolution, and um, the higher the resolution, the more detailed we could go, and hopefully, and perhaps more realistic. This was the seventh iteration in Bangkok. So they look a bit different each time as well. And this one was the one I did in Sharjah by Neil. You, uh, you see the setup is quite a bit different than one I'm doing at Slate, there's a um, uh, DIY video there actually. Um, but yeah, uh, didn't get the a monitor and player in time for Slate. Um, then, look, we're taking over the world. Andrew played here actually, <coughs> by the way, along with other big names. And of course, each one of them are even more different when you look at the details. So, can you find a country called Star? in this map. <coughs> so hint. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Claimed Japan, did you? Yeah. Well uh, Louis Biggs. Was that yeah, Louis, Louis Biggs is your Yeah. And yeah, quite a few other people actually. <coughs> anyway. Um well, earlier on, I mentioned having higher resolution image by involving more people in the game performance. And so, so basically more people, that's limited space. But then I, on the other hand, I also made bigger and bigger um, setup because of this, because I want to be able to hold a bigger story and, uh, and more holding more people in it. And um, uh, well, the other um, uh, kind of game performances almost require, um, requires a figure of authority, namely me, the artist, who interacts one on one. In this other one, I try leaving the work with a set of instructions so that people can have conversations between themselves, even without me. And this way they can plot to overthrow, maybe? <laughs> or, well, adjust uh, the rules to their own liking. Um, in many ways, they also give, it, give meaning to and take meaning from the work. Both with and without an authority figure, the idea is that the work acts like a receptacle. So it's a space where the references are, as much as possible, um, quite common and stimulating discussions within certain topic, basically. So the references need to be quite common, as I said, for example, also almost everyone can recognize the world map, even when they don't know what the Mercator projection is. And if someone's confused, the others will be able to explain. This, this one is in Jakarta, and it was made with um, agricultural products, basically, chili and everything. And so when people were um, um, uh, making the map, 
they were exporting and importing peanuts and chili and other stuff. And uh, the passport, well, uh, uh, th this last uh, few images are shown uh, from a cycle I call Nunanoton Palasler. And th this title is taken from a conversation in, um, in a story, in, in the story Le Petit Prince, <coughs> when the little prince meets a geographer in, in, in one of the worlds that he visited. Um, and this one was in Guangzhou. It was two layers. The first one was uh, uh, made in a, in a market, and then the footage from there were um, in, included in the Biennale Hall. Uh, and principally, principally Nuno Noto Pla, uh, uh, Nuno Noto Pala Fleur is a game performance that's recorded by surveillance camera, or a few surveillance cameras, and streamed live while simultaneously <coughs> processed into the time lapse. So, um, and the time lapse is also shown on a monitor. Um, this is a setup in Guangzhou Biennial, uh, which follows the same principle, of course, this, this image shows you the installation with rocks and projection, and the monitor, one of them is showing live stream and the other one um, showing time lapse video. Um, so when you enter the site, you see yourself in the, in the monitor, you see, you see yourself live in the monitor, and so you can navigate, you can locate yourself in space, but then you'll also see the time lapse of what has happened previously until that point that you enter the site, and so that's locating yourself within the timeline. Um, I've also been doing this cycle since 2009 in Patna in India, Singapore in 2010, Jakarta in Indonesia also in 2010, Fort Ragenhoek in the Netherlands uh, in 2011, Guangzhou in 2012, and here we see the most recent in Leiden in the Netherlands that's just ended a month ago. Each iteration is different. Nunanotong Palafle Patna was based on the map of India because it was done in Patna in India. Nunanotong Palafle Singapore was based on the map of Singapore. Um, yeah, so it's maybe, maybe it's like, you know, um, Hard Rock Hotel, <laughs> like Hard Rock um, Bali, Hard Rock Ibiza, Hard Rock Chicago, and you know. Um, and they somewhat respond to the local taste in each, but you know, it's not like Starbucks. I'm not saying that Hard Rock is you know, um, comparable to Starbucks, their hotel and coffee, but yeah, anyway, um, bad comparison. But anyway, in, in each of the Nuna Noton Palafle iteration, there is always an ephemeral material, <coughs> like me and you and growing plants, or agriculture products, like the one in Jakarta, and they're wilting and they're changing during the course of the, the, the game performance, basically. And these materials travels around the site through the actions of the, of the participants. Nuna Notong Palafleur Leiden is so far the most elaborate. The site is quite big and there are uh, four surveillance camera. So yeah, so four surveillance camera and eight monitors. And so um, each surveillance camera is uh, was going to two uh, monitors, basically. And they're showing the site from different angles. And, um, and it was 14 weeks. Um, and then, uh, and basically it started uh, with the map as we know it now, Mercator projection, very familiar to us. And then it, uh, gradually um, the game basically makes it um, evolved to Pangea, which is the state of the um, continents on Earth um, about 200 million years ago, uh, where all the continents are together, basically. Um, here's a time-lapse video of it, um, maybe a little bit, I'll show a little bit of it. So when you come to the site, you can see this in, uh, this in two of the eight monitors, basically. Uh, is it playing? No. So, well, um, so in the meanwhile, um, doing all these um, game performances and interactive installations, um, meeting a lot of people, thinking about a lot of things, um, 
I gradually realized how in um, my game performances especially, I really depend on um, physical props to make um, connections happen, or interaction at least. Um, the goal might be the connection or the interaction of people, um, you know, like differing of opinions and um, exchanging knowledge, casual knowledge about anything. Um, but really the objects are really active parts of it. Um, so, and this is what attracts me to Bruno Latour's actor network theory as well. I think it's also interesting how in animistic beliefs, um, objects are thought to have soul. Um, and looking at the relationship <coughs> between humans and objects, objects can sort of, I don't know, I mean, we, um, we sort of, um, well, because objects have meaning, right, um, to us, and so, so sometimes they, you know, they, they talk to us somehow, like, I'm thirsty. Oh, okay, bottle of water. The bottle of water actually, well, it, if it can speak, it speaks to me. Oh, yeah, just drink me, okay. And so, um, so that kind of thing. And um, we talked about this when, when I studied architecture, actually. <coughs> like, you know, if you enter a building or when you approach a building and you want to enter it, um, you immediately look for a door and it's, it's, you know, and when you get to the door, you look for the handle and the handle is sort of saying to you, eh, try me, try me, I might get you in, you know, so. <laughs> and, um, um, and, uh, it's interesting as well that uh, because I'm I'm reading um, material culture studies now a lot and this sort of thing is is dis being discussed there as well. So, and and my passports, for example, somehow speak to people. So I became really curious. So far, I've put this object in a receptacle. What if I try to open the receptacle? What will happen? And also, how how can I open this receptacle? So. Um, one of the first works that um, I did, I tried in this thinking, uh, was a workshop performance, and it's called Make Your Own Passport. I started doing it last year. Um, this is a workshop that's designed to be done in markets, a space where people, members of the public gather, often to see objects and to buy objects, to evaluate them as well, basically. So I prepared the passport making packages, and people are attracted firstly to the color, and then to the fact that it's a passport, it's passports and passports from all these countries that they even never even heard about. So then um, when they're going through the making, <coughs> the whole spectacle became attractive as well. Here we are in the market and we see templates for making passports and these people are, are actually making passports. Um, and I, I've got really thought provoking reactions actually. Several people got very emotional and angry, which is, understandable, I think, to a certain extent, and this makes me want to develop this work even further. Um, most reactions were so lovely, though, uh, which <coughs> makes the angry reactions even more important, I think. Um, so in the meanwhile, I became curious about other objects, you know, like um, I've, I've worked with objects from the border, um, or objects that remind us of borders, um, the passports, mosquitoes. <laughs> Um, I work with uh, maps, and I work with walls as well. And so, um, so I was thinking, okay, so what other objects? There must be a lot of other objects that you know can, um, um, I guess, uh, somehow stimulate a common. Um, what is it? Um, I mean, everyone has it. Everyone has this object. So what is it? Like money is one, for example. Um, uh, and it's, it's really interesting about, uh, money is really interesting also because it moves. Um, and then, uh, and also it's within a border, it moves within a border. And then um, a mobile phone, for example, is something that almost everyone has. In Indonesia, for example, even, you know, like it's, um, it's a must to have, uh, um, to have a mobile phone. And the first question uh, people would ask was, would be, you know, does, can this do Facebook? So <laughs> that um, and um, so an instant noodle. I was thinking is the other as well. It's 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 really sneaking into our lives basically, and everyone knows instant noodle. Some some hates it. Some well, just have to eat it. Um, and uh, that's when I started this project that I'm currently doing in Hong Kong. So um, 
uh, I was sort of um, limited to the um, what do you call that to the to the side well not really well I wanted to do a, a, sh a show in Hong Kong and so I was thinking okay if I do a show in Hong Kong I want to do something that can only be done there and so basically um, uh, my first impressions about um, Hong Kong um, include uh, the cardboard boxes basically and also how space is being <coughs> used really um, really well actually informal spaces as well and so uh, um, and I realized you know like there there were these um, old ladies pushing trolleys full of cardboard <coughs> and they would go to the recycling points and so, which in here in um, in London I realized well um, in the US as well the supermarkets will the shops would have their own bathing machine but in Hong Kong maybe because of space they would um, this uh, uh, functions are separated from each other basically and so there's um, the trays in between and so um, and um, and one of the one of my first impressions as well when I was thinking about the cardboards um, is also how um, the um, Filipino domestic helpers are using it every weekend basically and so um, um, these cardboard boxes travel through the city in Hong Kong, passing several nodes, and somehow their meaning and values and shapes actually shift while going through this network. And so following the cardboard boxes since last year has allowed me to con connect with each node in different degrees. And um, for me, it's amazing to see at this point, um, when I was doing my residency, I was editing the video from there, so I, <coughs> I was forced to take a distance from it. And so it was really interesting to see how border policies actually um, uh, seep into the, the, uh, the way society works as well. Um, um, and it reminds me um, of, um, of a passage in Jose Saramago's uh, novel, Death at Inter Intervals, where um, basically, oh, it's a long story, but basically um, uh, in one of the passage, um, movement, is used to detect border when the border line is not visible. Um, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the story. Basically, um, uh, death at intervals. The, the premise of the story is um, that one day in this country, um, in this you know um, country far away from us, um, uh, people stop dying, which is good. Like everyone was celebrating, like, "Hey, we're gonna live forever." But there are people who are at the edge of dying, who who are not happy, of course. You know, they're suffering. They want to die. And um, one of the uh, one of these people is a grandfather of a family, basically. And he was dying, and he was just at the edge. And so the family was thinking, okay, so how how do we how can we do this? Like he needs to die. So and we can't kill him. We can't kill him. So so they they got this idea to go to the border, basically, because it's only in that country that people are not dying. And so, so basically, they went to the border, and they saw they they couldn't see the line. Of course, I mean the lines are only on the map, and so um, so basically, they thought, okay, so how do we do this? Well, we'll just move. We'll just move with Grandpa, and he will know. He'll detect it, and he'll die. And so that's what <coughs> happened. So they just move along, and then he died. And that's the border. Um, uh, well, basically, uh, that's uh, I started drawing more murals in um, on the Filipino domestic helpers um, um, shelters. Um, I can tell you more about this actually um, uh, later on. In maybe I have to wrap up now. Um, basically, that's one of the spots where they gather, and then I follow the the trace. This is a, the recycling point in Central, one of them, um, and how they, you know, like loaded into trucks, and then they would go to the port where it, it it's going to be shipped to China, basically for recycling. Um, yeah. So in the meanwhile, I didn't forget about the mosquitoes. So apparently, though, they've managed to break free from the passports. So because they're very smart. And so they reappeared elsewhere. Um, here, for example, mosquito etching made with a printmaking collective in Jogja, Grafis Minggilan, 
And here's one of the artists from the collective, Denny Rahman, posing as though he's checking the print with, guess what, a mosquito racket. <laughs> reminds, this reminds me of, of the, that man, the, you know, <coughs> our neighbor in Jakarta did this. Anyway, um, and here is a recent work, Still Alive. And in, in this work, the beautiful crown tail fish in the flask was fed baby mosquitoes regularly, but it was excessive, excessive feeding. So quite a few mosquitoes had time to grow wings and they would grow it within two, three days. So quite quick, and so they could escape. And um, the fish is in the, uh, in the Evelyn Mayer uh, flask, and the nose of, the of that flask goes to another flask with a small gap through which the mosquitoes um, would be able to escape, but if on only if they're lucky or if they're skillful, whichever way they want to believe it. Um, the whole setup, as you he see here, includes a surveillance camera here um, that feeds the monitor with time lapse of what has happened and carefully positioned and framed so that the monitor also shows echoes of itself. Um, yeah, and last but not least, um, in time. Remember in the beginning I said I'm fascinated with multiverses, um, the many world interpretation. Uh, well, this theme keeps reappearing as well, like in this small video that I'll show you now. And thanks to this video, I had a knee injury actually because, uh, well, overuse of my knee. Um, I had to shoot this overnight so there were lots of jumping around and running around and bumping my knee to the floor and stuff. So please, please listen carefully because otherwise my knee wouldn't be happy. When I was born, God didn't play dice. He saw all the possibilities and created parallel universes. In each of them, I was born at exactly the same place on earth, but in a different time. And so I had a different citizenship. In one, I was born a hundred years earlier, and I was a Dutch East Indian. In another one, I was born 30 years earlier, and the Japanese won the war, so I became a Japanese East Indian. In this one, I was born five centuries after the invention of the printing press, which gave birth to the internet. Thanks to the Reformation, I can be an artist, and the internet allows me to collect passports from all the existing countries on Earth. I have 140 passports right now, doesn't that make me the most international artist in this universe? There you go. <laughs> Ten Ten, I'd like to ask you about um, the boxes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people. Were you saying the people lived in them? I didn't quite... Ah, I see. Yes, yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, well, no, people don't live in them. Um, well, some people may be in Central, but I'm, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know too much about them. Um, so basically, um, well, this, this uh, network of cardboard stakeholders, basically, they're, they're quite similar um, from the ones in Guangzhou, for example. Uh, sorry, in, in Korea, maybe Seoul. Um, so there, there would be, you know, like old ladies pushing carts. Not actually old, only old ladies. Old men also do it, and also young men and um, young ladies. But, um, but in Hong Kong, when I when I describe it, everyone just says, "Oh, the old ladies, right?" Yes, yes, it's, it's the old ladies. But anyway, so the um, um, so basically, it's the same. It's similar. It's very similar. You know, the the the, the waste collectors, informal waste collectors would push the cart, um, uh, collect the carts from the shops. And in Central, it's, you know, like um, Chanel, Prada, Marks and Spencer, basically, and so Starbucks. So they collect the, 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 the cardboards from there, and then they flatten it in the, in the trolley, and then they would push it all the way to the recycling point. And then in the recycling point, it gets compressed into bales, and then eventually it will get to um, the port to be shipped back to China. Um, uh, in, in Seoul, I imagine it's a similar um, route as well, but what makes, um, and, and this happens in all around Hong Kong as well, but um, what, what makes Central in Hong Kong really special is the weekends. 
because in the weekends the Filipino domestic helpers would uh, gather around the White House, and um, and some would gather in in um, in well a, quite a big number of them would gather in the park and and where they don't have to build anything because you know like well the parks are for hanging out basically so they can just sit there and um, do their thing, but um, I noticed that in circulation spaces, especially the footbridge, um, and usually it's the footbridge um, um, on the way to IFC Mall, um, it's close to the, wor the World White House in Central, and uh, uh, the pedestrian subway they built, and I think it's for privacy because you know it's circulation spaces, so people uh, would go around there, like you know, uh, continuously, constantly. There's constantly a stream of people basically, and so they need that space and so yeah so basically that's 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 what makes that particular place unique as well and so that's why I'm interested in, in it Hello. Um, I think it's interesting for all projects to be shown by various materials and especially um, timeless video shows what had happened in the process of uh -huh. installation. Uh -huh. But I think um, and it's, it's helpful for viewers to understand what was happened before. But is it, um, my question is, is, is it important for you to show process? Because I felt the result is quite enough for me. Ah, I see, okay. Yeah. And my, I have two questions. Yeah. yeah and second question is, um, do you want people um, to know about knowledge of your work? And is it important for you to inform those technology of your work uh -huh. for those in the world? Uh, does it make sense? Uh, can you say that again? Um, Explain a bit more. Uh, your work has uh, mosquitoes and passports. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And do you want people uh, to know that acknowledge? I don't know. Do I want people to um, know why I put them in there or something? Is that is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see. Mm. Okay about sending the message from ah, the work to people. Is it important? Yeah, I That's see. That's my question. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, hmm. I think, I think the, the, those t the answer to those two questions <coughs> are related. Yeah, so um, uh, um, I, I, I think earlier in the, in the, in the talk, um, I mentioned how, you know, like when I, when I put the, um, so I first made the passports with mosquitoes in it, and then I showed them. And then, um, so basically, uh, uh, and when, when I showed them, people would, you know, sometimes ask me, oh, mosquitoes, wow, and, and they, they would think that it's real. And, um, and yeah, and so, um, yeah, sometimes I, I, I I say that um, um, everything is fake in there, actually, you know, like the, the passport is fake, the, the mosquitoes are fake, the blood uh, specks are fake, the names might be real, although, you know, then, you know, it's, it's not the real people. Um, and, uh, okay, so, so, okay, so I, I showed that, and then um, um, people would, you know, ask me things. And I, I just thought that question, uh, that particular question of how did the mosquitoes get in there, how did you do it and stuff, was really interesting. And that's partly why I made the video, the micro study for one thing, where I swapped them. And then also then, you know, like people uh, kept asking me questions and then, you know, then I made the, the other um, work, which was um, uh, how I captured those wontons, the magic show. Um, so yeah, so okay, is it important for me to show the process? Because for you, the result is uh, enough. Um, and, um, and then the other one is, um, uh, 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 what is it? What's the other one? I can't remember now, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
um, oh, is it, is, is, is it important for me to, to, to send the message, to make people understand what, is it, what it's about, actually? I, I think, um, I think sometimes, I, sometimes I like to play in between. Um, um, uh, but yeah, so, so the process somehow, I like showing the process because then it, um, because of other reasons, not because, not particularly because I want to, you know, um, uh, tell people what to think, uh, but uh, uh, I just uh, thought it's, it's really nice um, uh, for me to be able to um, uh, provide uh, I don't know, a, a, a setup where, you know, where you can see where you are in the timeline, basically. Um, and and it, uh, partly it provides um, uh, information of what other people have done. And so it might, um, you know, uh, uh, motivate you to do maybe the same thing or maybe a different thing or, you know, just uh, anything. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think, um, I think every case would be, would be different as well. And in talks like this, of course, I'd like, I'd, I'd like to um, explain <laughs> as well, but, but uh, sometimes you can't explain, and I think for me that's okay as well, so. Would you think about um, would you think about to use your passport to go into some countries? Uh, well, um, actually, uh, uh, well, some people said that they want a passport and they tried it. I don't believe them. <laughs> I don't think it can be used actually, um, yeah. because you know, like the mosquitoes are there, and um, yeah, I think it's. <laughs> I don't. I don't think. Well, but have I thought about it? I actually. At one point, I was doing them. So I was, um, uh, I was going to exhibit them again, and I had a few uh, uh, stocks. Um, well, I have the whole thing, uh, the whole, I think at that point it was like 120 or something. And I, was, I, was, uh, I had some templates with me, and so I was like, okay. I was in the airport waiting for my luggage to come out, and it just took, took forever, basically. And I thought, okay, I'll sit down here and try to <laughs> not, you know, like, I, you know, if immigration comes, well, let, let it be, you know, I'll, I'll see what happens. And so I did it, and yeah. But n no one actually, no one cared. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was a bit disappointed, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't think I will. Um, Use will them. I try it? Maybe, you know, like, <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit, for me, it's threading between fear as well, because... <laughs> Because my passport, my real passport is Indonesian. Would you think about making like a world passport then? Oh, well, okay, that's a good question. I, um, um, I don't think I will make a world passport. I, I really, I will not, well, at this point, <laughs> I will not make a world passport because I think the point of uh, my making the, the passport, imitating the passports from all over the world, yeah. is basically um, to show them, to show all of them, in one, you know, one uh, level, basically. And I, I, uh, I arranged them um, uh, based on the gradation of color, basically. And that also <coughs> raised, raised quite interesting questions of, you know, like, oh, are all the red um, passports communist, communist countries? Or is it not? And, you know, it's, it's actually not. And why? Why are the the color the way they are and uh, this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I don't. Um, I I know someone who makes the world passport and actually sell them in the black them, market. Yeah, it's Gary Davis. Um, I I know him actually. Like, well, I haven't met him in person, and he passed away unfortunately. But um, I was in contact with him, and he he wanted to give me a world passport. I was in contact with him just before I was refused entry in Frankfurt, actually. And so <laughs> in Frankfurt, I just e emailed him again and say, hey, you know what? I'm refused entry in Frankfurt. I'm trapped here basically for 48 hours. I can't go anywhere and I have to go back. And he said, oh, this, you know, you deserve the world passport. Give me your, your address. Blah, blah. But then, you know, uh, but yeah. And then I, yeah. I, 
I didn't see the point, and yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, when you mentioned before about um, the things that everyone shares, like money and um, pot noodles and other things, who is we? Who is all people? Because it, 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 to me at least, it doesn't seem very like inclusive of mm. all all people. Like the map is. Mm. So who is who is those all people? Yeah, yeah, interesting. That's that's a good question. Thank you for that. Who is all people? People I know, I guess. That's the <laughs> definition. Yes, yeah. Um, um, but it's really interesting because when I um, when I uh, looked into instant noodles. Indonesia, where I'm from, is a big producer of instant noodles. And um, uh, it's really interesting. There's this brand called Indomie. And it, in Indonesia, the, the campaign, the ad campaign, it's just so, it's like nation building. It's like the pride of being Indonesian is Indomie. You know, like if you, you're not Indonesian if you, you don't know Indomie. And so I think in Indonesia, at least, everyone knows Indomie. Um, and, funnily enough, in Nigeria, <laughs> people think, Nigerians think, that Indomie is their national product. And it is, actually, because one of Indomie's factories, well, maybe two, actually, two of Indomie's factories are there in Nigeria, and the way they advertise the product is the same. It's exactly, you know, like nation building. We're Nigerians, we're all connected through the strands of Indomie, you know? So, yeah, so that's, that's, that's one thing that I found that, oh, okay, so these people that I don't know, you know, they, they share something, something with me as well. And so, yeah, but thank you for that question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Yeah. I was just going to ask, have you ever run into trouble like with, the, with like her workshops of making basically like facsimile passports? Have you ever run into trouble with like authorities or has, has it been like dictated how you make them? <coughs> Anything like that? Um, well, they're not really, uh, what do you call that? Uh, what do you call that? Forgery. Yes, that's right. It's not yeah. forgery. <laughs> um, and so I don't think they'll take me seriously. Um, I think uh, my, my original passport, my own passport, um, will create more problems than <laughs> the paper of passports, actually. Um, yeah, so, oh, and, and uh, yeah, sorry, can I get back to that question again, actually? Uh, we, who's, I, it, now I, you know, now I just uh, uh, remember it again. Um, so it's, it's um, uh, when I thought about, you know, the common object, um, and, and then I, you know, like I, I, um, I focused to, um, uh, I, I found out about Hong Kong, for example, the center of Hong Kong, cardboard, how cardboard is connecting this uh, network in Hong Kong. So basically, it's, I think the criteria is something that people hold in common and can connect them, but it's really specific to their, their group, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I'm still thinking a lot about this, but yeah, it's, it's, um, because, because then I think if, if um, yeah, pass, passports as well, actually, you know, like not everyone has passports, although everyone would know what it is. It's true, map also as well. But yeah, uh, I think I was in search of objects that are um, not, uh, it's common object, but it's not so common. <laughs> Well, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> anyway, I'm still thinking about it, but yeah, really, thank you for your question. It m helps clarify as well. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.